women in the room, can you just make some noise? I said, if there's any free women in the room, can you make some noise? You get to you get to celebrate because you are a daughter of the Most High God, and He calls you free. You may not feel free, but guess what? He declares that you are free. So I know it may not look like what He said, but you can declare today that I'm free. That I'm free today. I came to get my breath back today. I came to take authority. I came to take dominion. I am free. I am free women of God are you excited to be in the room there has truly been a shift in the atmosphere the entire time we were worshiping I could just feel that the, the Holy Spirit was sweeping in this room and I don't know what you came in here carrying today but I believe with everything inside of me that you are not going to leave the same way that you came. Go ahead and turn to your neighbor and say, the way you see me now is not going to be how I look when I leave. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can go ahead and have your seat. Have your seat. Whew, well, I um, want to just first and foremost introduce myself. My name is Sierra Thomas, and I'm thankful for the introduction that was already given. I am here all the way from Richmond, Virginia. <laughs> Richmond, Virginia. I've never, I've never been to Hall River, North Carolina, but so far, so good. I'm, I'm loving it here. Um, but first, I just want to give honor to the pastors and the leaders of this house. Um, yes, give it up for them. Pastor Shannon and Lady Tiffany Long. I have not had the chance to meet with you long, but I, I love this house. There's certain places where you come in and you immediately know that the Spirit of God rests in this place. My spirit is at ease, and I know that the Spirit God, Spirit of God lives and dwells here. And so I just pray that all that you have poured into this house, into this ministry, that God is going to do an overflow in you all's lives and you all's marriage. And so I just want to say thank you for this opportunity. I honor you um, and I bless you. I also want to give um, honor to Minister Clar Claricia. I just want to say thank you, y'all. She has been a gem. She has been a pleasure to just communicate with and has made me felt seen, loved, and welcome. So I just wanted to say thank you. I love to give honor where honor is due, and so I just wanted to give that. I also have um, some people with me that I brought from Richmond. Um, my friends, my sisters, my family, my mom, my grandmother, they're in the room. So I just want to say hello. I love you. Thank you for, for being with me. I'm the woman I am today um, because of you all. Well, I am here because I believe the Lord has a word for this house. I believe the Lord has a word for the women in the room. If you will, can you turn with me to Luke chapter 8? Luke chapter 8. We're going to be in verses 40 through 56. I know it's a lot of scripture, but I love to be in the word. Anybody love to read the word still? Amen. Amen. We're going to be reading from Luke chapter 8, verses 40 through 56. And it reads as this. When Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Just then, a man named Jairus came. He was a leader of the synagogue. He fell down at Jesus' feet and pleaded with him to come to his house because he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, and she was dying. While he was going, the crowds were nearly crushing him, a woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years who had spent all she had on doctors and yet could not be healed by any, approached from behind and touched the end of his robe. Instantly, her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds are hemming you in and pressing against you. Someone did touch me, said Jesus. I know that power has gone out from me. When the woman saw that she was discovered, she came trembling and fell down before him. In the presence of all the people, she declared in the reason she had touched him, and now she was instantly healed. Daughter, he said to her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And while he was still speaking, someone came from the synagogue leader's house and said, your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. When Jesus heard it, he answered him, don't be afraid, only believe, and she will be saved. 
After he came to the house, he let no one enter with him except Peter, John, James, and the child's father and mother. Everyone was crying and mourning for her, but he said, stop crying because she is not dead. She is asleep. They laughed at him because they knew she was dead. So he took her by the hand and called, child, get up. And her spirit returned and she got up at once. And then he gave orders that she be given something to eat. And her parents were astounded. But he instructed them to tell no one what had happened. I want you to announce my title today. The wait is over. The wait is over over. Spirit of the living God, I thank you that you have already done a thing in this room, Lord. I thank you that as women walked in through these doors, Lord, healing began to take place. God, I thank you that as women walked through this door, relationships were being restored. God, I thank you that as these women walked in this room, faith was being brought back to them. God, I thank you that you were so intentional, God, that you're so divine, that you knew we needed this moment before we were even born. So, God, I just pray now that your spirit will rise up in me boldly, Lord God, that as I speak, they won't look at me, Father God, but they will only see the God in me. God, you're worthy. You're glorious. I give you all the honor. I give you all the praise. And it is in your precious name that I pray. Amen. Amen. When I received the invitation to to come here for the Waiting to Exhale conference. I'm not going to lie, the name made me think of the movie Waiting to Exhale. Um, I Actually, that movie came out before my time, um, so I am dating myself just a little bit. Um, but something else that stood out to me was the word waiting. The word waiting. The word exhale sounds good. It's taking a breath. I knew what that meant. That was clear to me. But the word waiting, what does it mean to wait? And the definition of waiting is the action of staying where one is or delaying action until a particular time or until something else happens. We've been waiting to breathe again. We've been waiting in a particular place until something happens for us to feel as though we could breathe again. We've been waiting for healing to take place. We've been waiting for a new word to come. We've been waiting for a new situation. And we've been stuck in a place. And I grew up in church, and I was pretty much at every Bible study, every Sunday school. I, my friends would like to say, Sierra, you were born in a pew. You're always at church. And I was always reminded of these, these stories that we would just hear all the time. Whenever you would go to church and go to a women's event, the woman with the issue of blood was one of those stories. Many of us, when I say turn to Luke 8, you're like, oh, I know, I know that text. I know where we're heading today. But the woman with the issue of blood, this woman was bleeding for 12 years. She was suffering for 12 years. She was hiding for 12 years. This woman waited for 12 years to then, in an instant, be healed by a man named Jesus. And every time I looked at this passage, I couldn't help but just to see the faith that this woman had. I mean, the faith to say, I've been hiding, I've been in secret, I've been suffering, but I have the faith to believe that if I just go to this man, I believe that he could heal me. And not only faith to just touch him, but faith to believe that you would heal me. Because it's one thing to just believe that I could go to a thing, but it's another to believe that it's actually going to create change that something different is going to happen. We've been to women's conferences before. That's not hard to sign up for. But what's harder is to believe that the time that I leave here, that this time something's going to be different, that this time I'm not going to walk out carrying the same things that I was carrying when I walked in. And we've always focused on this woman with the issue of blood. But as I studied this text, I couldn't help but notice a tension between two tragedies. There's a woman and a girl in need of a touch from Jesus. There's a woman and a girl in need of a word from God. There's a woman and a girl in need of healing and restoration. There's a woman and a girl that is waiting. And I believe there are some women and there are some girls in this room who have been saying, God, I've heard the stories. God, I've seen you move. God, I've heard the miracles. But if I'm honest, I don't believe you're moving for me. God, if I'm honest, I don't think the miracle could happen. 
God, I'm still waiting for this addiction to end. God, I'm still waiting for my child to be saved. God, I'm still waiting for the house. God, I'm still waiting for the marriage to be restored. God, I'm waiting to see what you said. God, I'm waiting. And I believe that God specifically sent me on assignment today to tell you the wait is over. The wait is over is over. I don't know what you came in here carrying today. I don't know what you've been struggling with, but I want you to get that deep in your heart. I want you to declare it that the wait is over. Now, I know you all don't really know me too well, and um, hopefully by now we're family. Y'all can just invite me into the family. I'm going to come to the cookouts. I'm going to come hang out with y'all in the summertime. I'm going to be a regular here, but um, I want to tell you guys just a little bit about me, give you a little insight. Um, I just want to let you know that I am not a patient person. I don't know if there's anybody else in the room like me who is just like, patience is not my thing. Listen, I know when we gave our life to Christ, you know, we were given the fruits of the spirit and patience is one of them. And we should have all nine down to a T, but I don't, I don't. Um, truthfully, patience is one. I, I don't like to wait. I do not like to wait. Do I, I just want to know, do I have any online shoppers in the room? Anybody who likes to online shop? Okay, I got some women with me. So... <laughs> I always find myself, whenever I'm shopping online, that the moment I place my order, the page refreshes to another page that says, thank you so much for your purchase. And then typically it will give you a link um, with a tracking number to see when your package will arrive. Um, I typically always click the tracking number the minute I place the order. Sierra, the, the order has not even gone through. It hasn't been processed, but I just need to know. Give me an estimation of when my package is going to be arriving because I just need to know. Do I need to be at the house? Where do I need to be? I want to know where my package is coming. But one other um, instance that really is just hard for me is when you go out to eat and you get to the host stand and you tell them how many people you have. And they're like, OK, it's going to be about a 15 minute wait. And then you see another party come in and they say their name and they're like, come this right this way, right this way. And you're like, well, wait a minute. You just told me I had to wait. Guys, I'm going to be honest with y'all today. I, I promise I love the Lord. But I'd be like, wait a minute now. How did, how did they get in front of me? And don't let the food come before mine because then we're really going to have problems. We sat down before them. So how are they eating before me? There is nothing like watching someone else receive the very thing that you've been waiting for. You didn't wait as long as I had to wait. You didn't have as many sleepless nights as I had. You didn't have to work the late hours that I had to work. You didn't pray and fast the way that I did. How did she get picked first? How did they get the promotion? God, how did you let them get ahead of me? And in our text today, we are at the intersection of a miracle. Jesus is entering into Galilee and at this point he had been traveling around the cities and around the towns and he's been declaring he's come to fulfill his purpose and his assignment he's been preaching and he's been teaching and word has gotten out that the Messiah is amongst us the Messiah is living with us and he's a man that heals he's a man that restores I don't know I don't I can't explain it but you just have to get to this man and so he's in our text in Luke 8 Jesus is entering into the town of Galilee, and it says that crowds are beginning to gather around him. They all knew about this man named Jesus. They had heard about him, and so they wanted to see him for himself. So it made no, um, it was practical that these people were entering into this town, and they had a joy and a desperation to get to this man. They had a joy and a desperation. And amongst a crowd of people, there's a man named Jairus who makes his way to the feet of Jesus, begging him to come and save his daughter of 12 years. The text let us know that Jairus was a synagogue leader, which in today's time would be equivalent to a pastor or a preacher or a leader of someone with high ranking. So someone was always watching him and someone with this type of authority would not typically be in that type of posture. You wouldn't see someone with such leadership and so much valor be at the feet of Jesus. It was not common to kneel down in that way. But he positions himself at the feet of Jesus and desperately begs him about his only child, his daughter, his little girl. 
We see Jairus in the text, but I can only imagine that this little girl is laying down in her bed just hoping that this miracle will happen for me. I can't even see it happening, but I just have a little bit of hope that I'm sick and I'm not dead yet, but I'm just believing that something could actually happen for me. At this moment, this little girl, she was only sick. She was not yet dead. The girl was in a season of waiting. She was in the middle. She was in the middle. And in the middle, we have to make up our mind. Will I go for more or will this be it? Will I keep walking to Jesus or will I stay lying here in the pit of my bed? Will I keep moving and actually believe that he's capable of healing me or will I just lay here and be silent? No one really likes being in the middle. The middle is uncomfortable. The middle feels like you're being pressed against on every side, but it's in the middle where you decide, I can either stay here or I can keep moving. I can stay complacent in the middle because I'm starting to become comfortable because there's familiarity in the middle. In reality, we're miserable in the middle, but we don't have the courage to get up from here. You have got to make up in your mind that I am not going to lay here anymore. I'm going after my miracle and God, I'm not going to let you go until you give it to me. God, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. God, I've made my decision and I've decided to move. God, I can't stay here. And could it be that you have been waiting on God to move and God's been looking at you and saying, I'm waiting on you. We're constantly praying and asking, God, I need a move from God. I need a move from God. And he's saying, I'm waiting on a move from you. What did I tell you to do? Where did I tell you to go? Where did I tell you to serve? How did I ask you to show up? And we've been laying and not moving. We've been stuck in the middle. But today we've got to say, I got to get up. I can't stay where I'm at. I've got to move. I can't stay in this heartbreak. I've got to move. I can't stay in this mindset. I have to move. But what I love about the text is that while the healing is happening, or that while it is the healing for the little girl that we are waiting to see take place, she is not the one that's approaching Jesus. She's the one that's laying in her bed. She is stuck in her suffering. It was her father that moved on her behalf. And some of you thought today that you weren't going to be able to receive your breakthrough because you couldn't move. But your faith is what will move you forward, not your feet. You are walking by faith, not by sight. I know what my condition says about me, but what does your faith say about you? I know what the doctor said about you, but what does your faith say about you? It's time to move. But what happens while you're moving to God, everybody else is moving to him too? While this little girl was not physically moving to her father, her father was. But in this moment, another woman who had been waiting for 12 years also heard about a man named Jesus. And he make, she makes her move towards him too. The woman with the issue of blood, many of us know the story, but if you don't, this woman has had an internal bleeding that has been taking place for 12 years. See, sometimes there is a bleeding that takes place that only you know about, but sometimes there's a bleeding that begins to get exposed to other people. And so then that causes you to retreat and go into hiding because you're saying, I don't want people to see my condition. I don't want people to know what's happened to me. I don't want people to look at me any type of way. And at this time to be bleeding, that was an uncleanliness. People looked at her and could see her dirt. People could see her and see her sin. There was something wrong with this woman. And so that caused her to hide for 12 years. She had spent money on doctors. She had spent money and done everything that she could, every remedy, and she was still in the same condition. And truthfully, there are some of us in this room today whose story feels similar to this woman. I've been struggling with the same issues over and over and over again. I've been suffering for so long that I don't even have anything else left to give. And I didn't even want to come to this conference today because I was afraid that I would be exposed. 
I was afraid that I was going to bleed onto the next sister beside me. I was afraid that somebody was going to look at me just a little too long and actually be able to see what I've been struggling with. I've been bleeding for so long. And this woman, she's pressing through the crowd like everyone else. But when she touches the hem of his garment, he notices her. This woman who has been hiding, this woman who's been in isolation and discouraged has a sudden shift in her story. She has a sudden shift in her story. And I don't know who that might be for in the room today, but some of you are going to have a sudden shift in your story just because you came to this conference. You just had enough faith to say that if I could just get in the room, then just maybe I could touch the hem of his garment. If I could just get in the room, then just maybe the things that I've been praying and petitioning for will come to pass. If I could just get in the room, And as I was reading this text, I got so caught up in the miracle of this woman that I forgot the little girl was dying. This little girl was in her bed dying, but this woman is approaching Jesus. This little girl is at home. Jairus, can you imagine? He already had gotten the attention of his father. He had already said, Jesus, Jesus, my daughter is dying. I need you to come with me. I need you to heal her. And Jesus agrees. He says, I'm coming. And he knows I have the healer with me. So I know my daughter must be healed. I have his attention. But on the way, somebody else stops him. Jesus, what about me? God, what about me? We're running out of time. See, when Jesus doesn't move on our time, we begin to believe that the thing we're asking for can no longer happen. Jesus, what about me? You've forsaken me. You've forgotten me. I had your attention first. I got here first. How come you're meeting her need? How come you're talking to her? How come you're working in her life? Jesus, I was here first. Jesus, I'm standing in the middle of a miracle that was supposed to be mine. God, I'm watching you heal this woman when I asked for it first. It is so much harder to wait on your breakthrough when you are watching everyone else get theirs first. God, I just want to get out of this, but I keep seeing everyone around me get broken, breaking through and having revival in their lives and in their marriage and in their finances. God, when is my breakthrough going to happen? And we begin to become envious of others when we should use it as an encouragement. We've been looking at it all wrong. We've been looking at it wrong. Jesus stops and heals this woman. And I I, I would probably be like Jairus too. Like, Lord, why did you stop? But instead it could have been like, well, if I see you healing this woman, then that means you're still in the business of healing. If I see you changing lives of others, that means that you're still doing it for me. If I see that my sister just got a house, then baby, that means you're on my row. If that means that you're getting debt free, then it's coming to my bank account next. If your child just gave their life to Christ, then That means mine is coming to the throne next. If you see it happening around you, know you are next. Because if he can do it for you, he can do it for me. So the next time you see God doing a blessing in the sister's life beside you, I want you to just start saying thank you. I want you to start saying thank you. Yeah, that'll make the enemy upset. See, you can't have my mind or distort how I see it because what I know is that because you're blessing my sister, my blessing's on the way. My wait is almost over. Some of us have been looking at waiting wrong. I'm not just waiting. I'm standing in expectation. See, expectation is a strong belief that something will happen, that something will happen or be the case in the future. It means that I may not see it yet, but it will happen. And I love whenever I see the word will in the Bible because this is not a suggestion. It is a promise. And if he said it, then I'm going to see it. And he is a man that should not lie. So if he told you that the blessing was yours, then you need to claim it. If he told you the blessing was yours, start reaching for it. If he told you the blessing was yours, go ahead and start walking like he's already done it for you. He said what he said. And this requires us to block out anything that is trying to attack our belief. 
the belief that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I will see my child return to God. I believe that I will be healed. I want to know what took your belief? What changed your posture? There was a season in your walk with God that you believed that he could do all things. You didn't have no issue coming to the altar because you knew he was going to move on your behalf. But something happened along the way that you began to doubt that he could do what he said. You've been prophesied over. You've been spoken over. They told you you were supposed to write the book. They told you you were supposed to start the podcast. They told you you were supposed to start the business. But you're starting to grow weary in well-doing. God, I came into the year with expectation. God, I came into the year believing that this was going to be a year of breakthrough. But somewhere along the way, I've lost my belief. I'm starting to doubt that what you said would actually happen. And as Jesus was still healing this woman, in the midst of that miracle, a man comes to Jairus to inform him that his daughter had died. Can you imagine waiting for healing to come, to watch healing, and then to hear that you lost the thing that you were believing for? God, you told me if I would just believe you would do it. God, you told me if I had faith the size of a mustard seed, I could tell the mountain to move. And I told it to, but it didn't. God, why would you allow me to watch this happen? This man comes up to him and says, no need to bother the master anymore. Your daughter is dead. She is gone. And there are going to be people who will watch you wait on God to try and prove to you that he is not who he said he was. But God is not going to embarrass you. God is not going to go back on his word. God is not going to change what he said. So you can stand firm on it and know that my God is not going to have me out here looking crazy. I can start because I know that he said I could do it. He will not embarrass you. And I love, I love Jesus, y'all. I love his response. He doesn't even say anything to the man that approached Jairus. All he said to Jairus was, don't yield to your fear. Have faith in me. She will live again. She's getting her breath back. She's about to get her breath back. She will live again. Again, and you have been weary in your waiting because you have started yielding to your fear instead of walking in faith, instead of waiting with faith. And you've lost strength to wait and you've let the dream die because of what they said. And you've stopped believing that you could actually see it for yourself because of what they said. But I've come to declare that they that wait upon the Lord, that they shall rise up with strength, they shall mount up with wings as eagles they shall run and not grow weary they shall walk and not faint I know what you saw but look at what he said I know what you saw but look at what he said I have a word that I'm standing on I'm not standing on my condition I'm not standing on what you see I'm standing on what he said so here we are in this tension In this tension of two people desiring Jesus. Two people going after the same thing. And I just have a question. Have anybody in the room, have you ever just been like, I just want something to myself for once? I just, and if you got kids, you probably say it more often than not. I know I used to always just grab my mom's french fries, her food all the time. And it's just like, girl, Get your own. Like, I just want something for me for once. I don't want to share with everybody else because this is my place to finally have what I need by myself. I can get away for just a moment, relax, breathe. I don't want to tell you where I'm going. This is for me. I'm going by myself. I grew up as an only child, and one of the things that I loved most about that was that I didn't have to compete or share anything with anybody. It was just me. It was just me. Um, But now, you guys, um, I have a 16-month-old brother 
I said a brother. I'll tell you the story afterwards if you want to hear it. Um, <laughs> But I remember enjoying being an only child because whenever I needed something from my parents, I had their full attention. I never had to like beg or like pull on their shirt or tug on them. It was just me. They had nobody else to worry about or be concerned about. Um, there was nobody else that was asking for their attention. Um, but now my dad, he has two children. And now I'm starting to navigate watching him answer the need of two of his children. When my little brother is crying for something because he, he's in need, I'm not, I don't get upset. I don't get upset. I understand that he's hungry, he's tired, he needs his diaper changed. Whatever it is, I understand that there's something he's in need of, and my father needs to get to him before he gets to me. But I know that my dad is still aware of my ask. He's still aware of my need, but I am mature enough to know that my brother and I can't wait the same. We don't have the same amount of weight. And so I know that, hey, I'm going to allow you to get to my father first because you need him in a way that I don't need him right now. And the thing that I had to recognize is that even though he had his attention first, I know that my father is capable of taking care of both of his children. And I just wanted to remind somebody today of their history with their father. I want you to know that it may have felt like you've been forsaken and forgotten, but your God has not left you, nor has he abandoned you. And thanks be unto God that we serve a father who can say, daughter, I'm walking with you, but wait a minute, my other daughter needs me. Baby, I'm still with you. I haven't left you, but my other daughter needs me. Come with me. I'm still going to do what I said in your life, but my daughter needs me. We serve a God who is capable of dealing with all of our needs. And I know you've been waiting. I know you've been waiting. And God, you're, you're saying, God, I'm weary. God, I'm tired of waiting. God, I'm tired of believing. God, I'm tired. And I believe God today is saying, I'm on the way. I'm on the way. I know you thought this was your last, but I'm on the way. I know they told you that the cancer was going to kill you, but I'm on the way. I need you to just wait a little bit longer because I'm on the way. And I don't believe that Jairus was just watching Jesus heal the woman with the issue of blood for coincidence. I believe this was intentional. When I was reading it, I couldn't believe, Jesus, why would you allow someone else to watch this take place? That just don't feel like, I just don't feel like that's in your character. That's in your nature. But it wasn't until we see this little girl brought back to life at the end of the text that I believe I've understood why the wait was worth it. God said, if I were to give it to you how you want it and in the way that you think you should have it, you are going to think that you got it on your own strength. See, Jairus knew him to be a healer, but Jesus wanted to introduce himself as a redeemer. And you've been asking God to help you get through the pain. And God said, I'm about to cancel the whole diagnosis. You've been asking God to give you a promotion. And he said, I'm about to give you the whole business. You've been asking for healing to take place. And he's about to say, you're never going to have to see a doctor again. We serve a God of Ephesians 3.20 who can do above and beyond what we even ask, think, or imagine. It's an exceedingly and abundantly blessing. It's more than you thought to pray for. It's more than you thought to ask for. And I just need us to get out of this mindset that you're not waiting because God is trying to punish you. You are in a season of waiting because he wants an opportunity for him to prove himself to you. He is Jehovah Rapha. He is Jehovah Shalom. He is Adonai. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Will you let God introduce himself to you? Will you allow God to show himself to you in a new way today? And finally, we see Jesus make his way to this little girl, just like he said he would. But among his arrival, Jesus is greeted with doubt. He's greeted with people who are saying, Jesus, Jesus, this, this woman, she, she's dead. She's no longer alive. We no longer need you. Jesus said, she's not dead. She's just asleep. It is important that you are aware of the people in your weight. 
when you are in your waiting season, it is an important thing to recognize the people that are around you, the people that are attached to you, because the people are going to be the thing that either pushes you to promise or pulls you away from it. The people around you, you've got to check who is in your circle. Because if you're going to come up to me and tell me that my God can't heal, baby, I don't need you hanging out with me. If you're going to tell me that my child will never give his life to Christ, baby, I don't need you hanging out with me. If you're going to tell me that the God that I serve isn't able to do above and beyond what I'm asking for, baby, you can't hang out with me. You've got to watch the people who are in your circle. Who are the people in your family, in your job? And it sucks when it's the people that we think should be rocking with us. It's even worse when it's the person you met in church. Girl, we we was going to Bible study together. What happened to your faith? What happened to your belief? People are going to try and change and create a narrative to your story, but they don't know your God. You got to let them know that you can't look at me, honey. You can't look at what my story says. You can't look at my situation, but I need you to look unto the hills from which my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord. It's not in my strength, but it's by his power and by his spirit that I'm walking, that I'm a living, breathing testimony. I had nothing to do with this blessing. I had nothing nothing to do with this yes I had nothing to do with what you see but you are looking at a miracle you got to check the people in your circle not everyone can witness you in your waiting season there's going to be some relationships and some people that you're going to have to check because not everybody can wait with you in your waiting season We see it because Jesus only allowed Peter, James, and John to go into the room with them. He was like, I can't have everybody around this miracle. I can't have everybody around this blessing because if your belief is in the room, it's going to taint somebody else. If your belief, unbelief is in the room, somebody else is going to start not believing in what I can do. So I can only take certain people with me. Do not be afraid to cut people off as you exit your waiting season. As you exit what you thought was going to be something that you were living in, there's going to be some people who started the journey with you that won't be there when it's over. Don't be afraid to cut people out your circle. Because the moment he addresses the people, they began saying what only they could see. So you have to watch your proclamation in your waiting season. What have you declared dead that God is trying to resurrect? What have you spoken over saying that this is no longer that God is saying, I'm trying to show you that I'm a redeemer? What have you canceled that God is saying, no, I'm calling it to get up? What have you canceled that you're saying it can't happen no more? I stopped believing for it because there's no more breath. But I believe there's some woman in here who said, I'm coming to get my breath back. I'm beginning to proclaim and believe that I have my breath back. I know I walked in here and you thought I was dead, but I got my breath back. I know I walked in here and you thought it was over but I got my breath back I'm not declaring I'm dead anymore he said a new thing is begun forget the past all things have passed away behold I'm doing a new thing baby you're looking at a new thing baby you're looking at a new thing I got new breath. I got new wind. You got to start watching your proclamation. You got to start watching what you speak over your situation you got to start watch what start watching what you say Watch your proclamation. And what's crazy is we love to place blame on the enemy. Oh, the enemy got me in this season. The enemy got me in this situation. But could it be that it's not the enemy, but it's really your inner me? You've been speaking and saying things that the enemy hasn't even had to do no work. You've been doing it for him. You've been canceling and denouncing things that God is saying, baby, I called you to do it. The book is supposed to have your name on it. The podcast is supposed to start. The women's ministry is supposed to begin. But you've been calling it dead and the enemy don't even have anything to attack because you've announced it dead. Stop doing the work of the enemy. He don't got to do no work because we've been doing it for him. Watch The people in your waiting, you've got to watch your proclamation in your waiting. 
And then I need you to walk in power even in your weight. Jesus says, little girl, get up. Little girl, get up. Daughter, get up. Woman of God, get up. I know it's been heavy. I know the weight of the world has felt like it's been on your shoulders, but get up. The little girl got her breath back. We talked about it earlier when you finish running a race and you feel like you can't breathe. You bend over, you begin to stop. But the moment that your breath returns to you, you need to return running. So some of you have been stopped in a place that was only been meant for a moment, but you've been staying here a little too long. You've got your breath back. When you came to this conference, God said, I'm breathing it back into you. When you leave this room, you can't stay where you were. When you leave this room, I need you to take off running. When I, when you leave this room, I need you to recognize that the breath that you had before before you came is a new breath. You got to get up. He's given you power to go. I understand that you didn't see it happen when you thought it would. It didn't happen in the way that you thought it would. But look what he did. The woman with the issue of blood waited for 12 years. And then the wait was over. This daughter, only 12 years old, dying, and the wait was over. I found it so significant that the woman and the daughter had both been in a moment for 12 years. 12 years. And I looked, I said, God, the number 12 seems to be significant in this moment. God, why the number 12? So I had to look it up. And the number 12 is a number of completion. It's a holy number. This wasn't some coincidence. This wasn't some accident. God was trying to tell us that the wait is over. It is finished. I can wait well knowing that the battle is already won. I can wait well knowing that it is already finished. I can wait well knowing that death, hell, and the grave have been defeated. And I believe that God was just so intentional about the name of this conference. Waiting to exhale. Waiting to exhale. And I prophetically believe that God sent me to tell you that the wait is over. He put specific women on my mind as I was preparing for this text and said that there's some ladies in here who've been doing this church thing for a really long time. And they've seen my hand be on everyone else. And they have started to think that I've forgotten them. They've started to think that I've overlooked them. I need you to remind my daughters. I see you. I have not forsaken you. Do not grow weary in well-doing. I am giving you your breath back. And when your breath returns to you, don't waste it. Don't waste your breath. I believe that there are some things that some of you are praying and believing for in this moment and I just want to take a moment to invite specific people to the altar. Um, God, there was two types of women that I believe that God said that this message was particularly for. The first woman is a woman who has been like the woman with the issue of blood. You've been suffering for years. You've been suffering for a really long time. And you don't even know if you have the strength to press through to even touch Jesus' hand. You've been saying, I can't, I don't have the strength to press through. I believe that God is saying, if you would just meet me at this altar, 
an immediate blessing will take place. And the other person I believe this word was for was for the one who felt like the daughter, who felt like your life was coming to a close. You felt like your life was over. You felt like your life was ending. You felt like you didn't have any breath back. It was hard to breathe. It felt like you couldn't even get up in the morning because why? What's the purpose? What's the reason? I've been here too long. I've done this. I've been waiting so long. I don't even know what to wait for anymore. I believe God sent me on specific assignment to say, girl, get up. I'm giving you your breath back. They're coming even now. I just want to invite you to this altar. If you feel like one of those women is who you are in this moment, I just want to invite you to this moment. I just want to pray for you specifically because I believe that this is a a prophetic moment, a declaration to the season that you're in, that you're saying that I don't believe that this is where I'm going to stay any longer. I've been in this tension too long, but it's today I'm declaring the wait is over. I'm not waiting any longer for my blessing. I'm not waiting any longer for my healing. I'm not waiting any longer for everybody else to just pass me on by. But I believe that today, prophetically, that this movement, as you moved, just like the woman with the issue of blood, just like the daughter and her father on behalf of her, just like they moved to Jesus, I believe that this movement was your declaration. This moment, movement was your declaration. The wait is over. Father God, I thank you that even now your daughters are beginning to feel your healing in this moment. Father God, I thank you that the children that they thought were gone and have left you, Father God, that they're returning to you now. God, I thank you that every diagnosis that was given to these women is now canceled in the name of Jesus. God, I thank you that you are beginning to give restoration and healing to your daughters. God, I thank you that what you've started in them, you will see to completion. That he who starts a thing will be faithful to complete it. Father God, I thank you that you are not done with these women yet, that they have been called for such a time as this, for such a time as this. And God, I just speak a divine favor over the women of this house. I pray that every door that they knock on, it will be open. I pray that every window will be open. Father God, I pray that you will begin to pour out a blessing that they don't even have room enough for. Father God, I pray that these women will begin to operate in an overflow. Father God, I pray that these women will begin to operate out of overflow. Father, when they people see them, they're just going to see the anointing rolling off of them. Father God, when people see them, they're going to say, what happened to you? You look different. What happened to you? You don't look the same way that you did when you came. God, I thank you that you are doing a new thing. God, I thank you that your women just got their breath back. God, I thank you that your women just got their breath back. God, I thank you that they waited all week for this moment and they will not leave without getting what they came for. And I just ask that you will begin to start posturing yourself. We see Jesus We see the woman woman with the issue of the blood and the man get down in a posture of humility, in a posture of saying, God, I can't do this any longer. God, we change our posture today. We believe that what we're expecting for, what we're praying for, we will see it in the land of the living. It won't be just for the generation coming after me. It's going to be for me. It's not going to just be for my children and my grandchildren. It's going to be for me. It's not just going to be for everybody else around me. I'm going to see it for me. God, I thank you. God, I thank you. That you are a man that cannot lie. So if you said it, we're going to see it. God, that if you said it, We're going to see it. God, I thank you that you're bringing back dreams. God, I thank you that you're bringing back vision. God, I thank you that you're bringing back everything that these women asked for. God, I thank you. God, I thank you. Lord, do what only you can do in their lives. So that when people see them, they'll know that they had nothing to do with this blessing. That this was only a move of God 
that I had enough faith to come to the altar, that I had enough faith to make my way to Jesus, that I had enough faith to push my way through the crowd, that I had enough faith to keep pressing and to keep seeking, that I had enough faith to keep reading and keep declaring. I had enough faith to keep going. The wait is over. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name.